Turn to Matthew chapter 18 for the text of the night. Matthew chapter 18. Hmm. Does it sound as loud? Does it need to be louder? Because Sister Nikki can sure turn up some stuff. We want you to be able to hear without having to struggle. Sister Nikki, will you turn just the master, the two, because I did turn the, the master house down. Just those two on the very far, you know which ones, the very far last two buttons. Chapter 18, thank you, Sister Nikki, verse 21. Her batteries were running a little low on her hearing aid tonight, so we needed to turn up just to here. Just a little bit. Everybody found it? This is just going to be where I take the theme. Remember, I, this is part three of the series, Total Forgiveness. Then Peter, verse 21, came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he'd begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and his children and all that he had and a repayment to be made. So the slave fell on the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me. Have mercy. I will repay everything. And the Lord of the slave felt compassion and released to him and forgave him the debt. But the slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay me back what you owe me. This fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience, have mercy with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling, and he went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what he owed. Then when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that they had happened. And then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all of that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have also had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that he owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Father, bless this word tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, I gave you 10 things on what forgiveness is not. And tonight, I want to give you 10 things on what forgiveness is. And then uh, next week, I'm going to give you uh, seven steps toward forgiveness. And then the next week will be name that tune and breakfast for supper. We'll be eating bacon and eggs and grits and sausage and casseroles and uh, uh, donuts and muffins and the uh, sister Sandra will be playing name that tune on the piano and we're just going to have a family fellowship night uh, that's a couple of weeks from now so let me give you tonight 10 things and you know I have to do that quickly 10 things forgiveness is number one forgiveness is being aware of what someone has done but still forgiving them. You are totally aware of what they did to you. You're totally aware of how they abused you, how they used you, how they mistreated you. You remember it no matter what it was. You are not trying to cover it up. You're not trying to make an excuse for it, which was some of last week's points. You're not trying to refuse to acknowledge what happened. You are remembering the details of the crime committed against you, but you are still forgiving. Sooner or later, even in your grief, even in your anger, even in your sorrow, even in your hurt, when you choose to repay forgiveness with forgiveness, 
then what you have to be aware is sooner or later you come to the reality is not by feelings. I am going to choose to forgive you. I think I said that the very first week of this series. You must make, you do not wait for you to get that, oh, I feel like I need to forgive them. No, you don't ever wait on feelings. Never. Because you'll always have, always have an excuse why you shouldn't forgive somebody that's hurt you. Amen? But you choose to forgive. And listen, avoiding that it happened, avoiding what they did to you, avoiding how rude they were or how bad they talked or how you were mistreated, acting like it didn't happen is not some sign of spiritual victory. Oh, I don't even, no, no, no. That's not victory. Victory is you see what they did and you choose to forgive anyway. You've got to acknowledge it. You've got to be able to say to yourself, what they said to me hurt me. What they did to me scarred me. But God, I forgive them. Hasn't God forgiven you? Hasn't God forgiven you of all of your debts and all of your sins? Hasn't God washed all your sins away? Then shouldn't you also forgive all those who've sinned against you? Say yes, Pastor Chris. Number two. Here's what total forgiveness is, by the way. This is all from the book, Total Forgiveness by R.T. Kendall. I don't want anybody to think these are my ten points. Go, go buy the book. I'm only preaching points of chapter one and chapter two. The other eight chapters you can read on your own. Number two, choosing to keep no record of wrong. Total forgiveness is I do not keep a record. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, love keeps no record of wrong. You cannot say that you forgive somebody and continually bring up what they did to you. Wives, husbands, you cannot say, oh, I forgive you, honey. And then in a week when you get mad, you bring up everything he's done in the past. That's not forgetting. Rocky, quit looking at Mandy like that. I, eyes on me. Eyes on me. Eyes on me. So what you want to make sure of you for, listen, and I told you last week, you may not ever forget it, you just choose not to remember it. But you cannot keep a record of everything somebody's ever done wrong so that when they trip up, you can remind them of how bad they've been in your life. You can remind them of how many times they've hurt you. Well, you've always hurt me. You've always been ill to me. You've always spoke down to me. You've always, wh what do you mean you've always? You forgave all that. So the next time they hurt you is the first time. Because you keep no record of wrong. Uh-oh. Number three. You refuse to punish. Total forgiveness is, I refuse to punish. You must give up the desire to get even with. I'm going to get revenge. Not if you've got total forgiveness. Total forgiveness is not hoping you meet somebody in the back alley at dark by yourself. That's not, Jennifer, watch what you say, you in church. I'm calling all y'all out tonight. I'm calling all y'all out tonight. You, you, total forgiveness is you have no desire to, for them to get what's coming to them. Remember what I said week one, you're, you're praying blessings on them. You're praying increase for their life. You're praying what goodness over them it's unfair they need to be punished and unless they ask unless they repent to God they'll get what's coming to them but that's not my business if you can get out of the way of God being God sidestep that matter and just let God be God it relieves you of the responsibility of making sure God judges somebody you won't judge I better say that again if you'll get out of God's way and quit trying to make sure he judges somebody you want to be judged, it will relieve you of the pressure. Do not think you've got to punish. What the, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear. But listen to this next sentence. And listen, I had to read some other versions to make sure this was right. 
Because we always say this, perfect love drives out fear. And we stop there. So when I was studying this, I went, because, you know, I, I have several versions of the Bible. I've been reading a New Testament version called the Recovery Version that I'd never heard of. Watchman Nee and Watchman, Watchman Nee, Watchman Lee, is that his last? It's a Bible they came up with. It's, it's a translation they came up with. So I went, oh, these are, these these foreigners have come up with a wrong version. And I'm, so I, I'm looking, I'm reading some King James trying to make sure, and it's in there. So let me finish now. Because we always stop with perfect love drives out all fear. But listen to after, this, after the comma. Because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made of perfect in love. Fear is connected to punishment. You are afraid of the punishment, and therefore, if I love somebody, I'm releasing them of punishment because that perfect love is driving out that fear, and out with that fear goes that punishment because I'm releasing them of that. And I want to say this again. This is the third time, and I'm not going to say it anymore. It is not your responsibility to make sure God does his job. Quit making yourself so stressed out. Let God be God. Amen? Number four, uh-oh, here's what true forgiveness is. Here's what total forgiveness is, not telling people what they did to you. Total forgiveness is not telling people what they did to you. We all want to have somebody with ears that we can tell how we were done wrong. Y'all got real quiet. And without that air conditioning running, it was real quiet. <laughs> I mean, it was real quiet in here. Listen, if you feel like you need to release it because talking about it helps, find you a professional person that is confidential that ain't telling nobody. Because here's what happens. Let me tell you what George did. And you just, because it makes you feel better to get it off your chest. But before long, you have ran George down to about 17 other people. You have destroyed George's reputation. You have undermined what God wants to do in George's life. Now, people who would have had confidence in George doesn't have confidence in George because you could not keep your mouth closed because you felt justified releasing your pain on somebody else at George's expense. Well, he hurt me, but that ain't nobody else's business. Total forgiveness is, God, this, God you know what George did. Pastor Chris, I need to talk to you. I, I got to get some stuff off my chest. That's wise, because I don't tell you business. Well, you'll never look at me the same. Now, here's the awesome things about people called to pastor. We can know all kind of dirt, and we never look at you dirty. I'm going to say that again. We can know all kind of dirt and not look at you dirty. It's a gift pastors have. It's a gift people with a true pastoral heart have. Amy and I honestly can hear your trash and not smell your garbage. And we can give you the advice you need to begin to overcome. All right? We're not going to belittle what, because, but when you go and start telling everybody else, you're doing more harm than you are good. Gossip is not justified even when you're hurt. Gossip is not justified even when you're hurt. When we start telling, we're hurting George's reputation. And we think that's a form of punishing them. Well, I want everybody to hate George like I hate him. Well, you ain't in, you ain't in the right place because you ain't supposed to hate. You know what I mean? I want everybody to be against George. But that ain't, you, you, can, you know you're not forgiving George because you're not against him. You're praying God bless him. Y'all with me? It's, I know it ain't easy. I'm glad I'm the one teaching it, not sitting there, being called out. Number five, true total forgiveness is being merciful. In the text that I read to you, it started out with Peter saying, how many times are we going to forgive those that hurt us? Seven times? Oh, no, Pete. Seventy times seven. You're going to keep on forgiving. And then it, you can't stop there without reading that, the rest of that chapter as I did because you can see how 
somebody was punished because they could not offer the same forgiveness offered to them. Matthew chapter 5 verse 17 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. If you want to be shown mercy, you've got to be merciful. If you want to be forgiven, you've got to show forgiveness. It's God's job to punish. It's God's job to deal with people. You see, mercy is the opposite of wanting to punish. Mercy is wanting people to be restored. I'll say that again. Mercy is the opposite of wanting people punished. punish. It's wanting people to be restored. If George hurts you, if he's abused you, if he's spoken down to you, there's issues in George's life that needs, God needs to restore. Mercy is going, God, I don't know why George is so mean. I don't know why George is so abusive. But God, I pray that you restore him into a right place with you. I pray peace in his life. I pray victory over his mind. I, you see the difference? That's mercy. Mercy is you've got a desire for the hurt in your abuser to be fixed so they won't abuse. Matthew 5 verse 7 also says, show mercy and mercy will be shown. Number six. I'm moving through these in a hurry, Carrie. Here is total forgiveness. Graciousness. True forgiveness shows mercy and grace at the same time. Graciousness is shown by what we don't say, even when we know we could say it. Graciousness is knowing I've got every right according to the world to get even with George. George. Graciousness is I'm not going to say all the stuff I could say. Have you ever started a conversation with somebody and it, you almost started spilling the beans of how bad Saint George was and then the spirit stopped and you went and you just look <laughs> trying to figure out what good you could, you know what I mean? Or is that just me? Uh-oh, I got it. I, mm, yeah, well, good luck to you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, God love you. God bless you. God bless your heart. You know, so it, it really is graciousness is, lear and listen, and I want to use say this, graciousness is almost a learned, mm -mm, disciplined behavior. Learn would be incorrect because it should come from your spirit, but it's something that requires a lot of discipline. To be able to be gracious to my enemy, to be able to withhold slander from my mouth because my mouth is too holy to slander. My mouth should be too holy to slander. See, I think we forget that we're supposed to be saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, but yet we slander folk, we curse folk, we condemn folk, we abuse folk. Can bitter fruit and good fruit, sweet fruit come from the same vine? Can't, no, no, but yet we as Christians have not disciplined ourselves enough to be able to be gracious in our conversations. And not just our conversations, but gracious in our actions. Listen, we have all seen Betty Sue and ran to the other side of the aisle hoping we would avoid her, right? Or are we the only folk to see Betty Sue? And you're like, I just got to get away, Lord. I don't even want to see Betty Sue. Graciousness is I'm able to see Betty Sue, greet Betty Sue with a voice of compassion. Keep on going. With, watch this now. Y'all stay with me. Without me beginning to run her down while she's pushing her buggy cart the other way. Lord, help me. I'm feeling convicted in my own self. Because how many of us have seen Betty Sue? Well, hi, Sister Betty Sue. That old low-down dog, she ain't nothing. Right? And, Sue, and then you're like, shut up. She's right there. Quit talking so loud, Amy. <laughs> no, not really. That's, Belle does that. Not, that's, not, that's not Amy. Graciousness is I'm disciplining myself, even if it's just myself. Because watch what happens. 
If I don't discipline myself, even when nobody else is around, I am now planting, planting fresh seed of hurt. I am planting fresh seed of betrayal back into my heart that I'd already forgiven. And because I don't discipline graciousness in my life, I keep on growing seeds of bitterness over Betty Sue because I will not discipline my mind to be gracious. Ooh, y'all, that's some deep teaching there. So I keep on, I, I forgive Betty Sue until I see her. And now I'm now planting, I'm now going to plant new seeds I'm now going to deal with in a few months because I didn't discipline myself to be gracious. Y'all with me? John chapter 8 verse 7 says, if any one of you is without sin, you let him cast the, the first stone. That woman was right up in the middle of adultery. Had every reason to be stoned by the law. Jesus practiced graciousness. He could have said, give her what she deserves. Throw the stones. But he didn't. Just because you have a right to do something doesn't mean you should do it. Just because you can justify yourself doesn't mean you should do it. Total forgiveness is being gracious. Number seven, I'm afraid I'm going to make everybody mad. I ain't going to have nobody next week. Number seven, total forgiveness is an inner condition. It's an inner inside condition. Total forgiveness must take place in the depth of your heart. Starts in your mind, but then it's a choice of the heart, and it has to take place deep. Because watch this. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34 says, Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What are you speaking about your enemy? Is there total forgiveness there? What are you speaking about Betty Sue? Is there total forgiveness there? What are you, what are you speaking about George? Is there total forgiveness there? Because total forgiveness, once it's inside of you, out of that heart. See, when I'm, when I'm praying, God, you bless Betty Sue. God, you bless George. Before long, out of my mouth, I'm speaking positive things. I'm speaking praiseworthy things, not words of condemnation. I'm speaking blessings, not cursings, because in my heart, total forgiveness has taken place. If there is unforgiveness in your heart, it will come out eventually. You can fake it for a while until the pressure is just right or just wrong. <laughs> you know, you, you can fake it, smile, you can make it through it, and then all of a sudden, that big old metal pot with a steamer on the top that you put your grandmama used to can or cans in. You know, my sister Juan is still, well, she's a grandma. That's why she's used that that canner and that thing starts to rock and rattle on the inside on the stove and you're like oh lord is it gonna blow it's gonna blow oh my goodness oh my goodness and what happens is if you don't deal with unforgiveness the pressures of life will bring it right back to the top and you will ruin a whole batch of green beans thank you no don't do that because one day we're going to all come to your house for green beans. Y'all put up a hundred cans every year. What's in your heart? What's coming out of you? Because that really shows what's in you. Remember, I, I used this on week one. Remember Jesus dying on the cross says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Not one person at the foot of the cross asked for forgiveness. Not one person at the cross was ashamed of how they were treating him. Not one person was embarrassed of the bruises on his face where they hit him. Not one person felt sorrowful for where they plucked his beard from his face. Not one person felt sorrow for the crown that pierced his brow. But yet Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Why? Because in the core of his being was forgiveness. And that's why you're here tonight. Because in the core of his being was forgiveness. 
out of his love, he forgave you. And out of our love for him, we too will forgive because it's in us. You know, we, we always talk about Jesus is in me. But if he's in us, has he taken control of us yet? I want him to be so in me that I love like he loves and I forgive. Even though the person who harmed me has not even felt embarrassed or ashamed and they ain't never going to ask forgiveness. But I choose to forgive. Number eight. Total forgiveness is the absence of bitterness. It's the absence of bitterness. Bitterness is an inward condition. It's an excessive desire for vengeance that comes from a lot of resentment in your life. When you begin to have total forgiveness, watch this. As the bitterness gets out of the way, the Holy Spirit now has room to move in your life. If you can imagine, and, and I don't know if I can paint this picture, as long as I deal with unforgiveness and I have walls of bitterness in my life, it's almost like a maze and the Holy Ghost does not have free reign. It's like my dog with the shock collar. Run as hard as you can until you get to that border. Beep, 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 beep. And the dog starts yupping and moving back toward the house. And what happens is because we do not operate in total forgiveness, then we are saying, Holy Ghost, I give you a perimeter to work in, but don't you dare cross the line. You cannot cross the boundaries that I set, Holy Ghost, and he doesn't have free reign in your, house, in your life. When you begin to uh, operate in total forgiveness, you're removing the boundaries. You're removing the maze that he, you're making him try to work to figure out how to get to point A to point B. And now he has total access. He doesn't have to go through the obstacle course. He has total reign. Why? Because when you remove bitterness from your life, you're giving God the ability to move in your life. When you remove the absence, when you have an absence of bitterness, now you can be like Jesus. When I have bitterness in my life, I am acting more like bitterness than I am like Jesus. Let go of bitterness. When you let it go and you get rid of it through total forgiveness, you're going to have joy. You're going to have peace. You're going to have the knowledge of His will. When you're able to forgive those that have sinned against you, oh my goodness, peace flows in your life. It's an awesome feeling. It's like forgiving a debt, a, a, a financial debt. If you've ever had the opportunity to do that, it's so cool when somebody owes you money and you go, oh, it's, it's taken care of. Don't worry about it. Well, no, no, I'm going to pay you. No, you don't have to pay me. It's done. It's free. All of, now you operating in a spirit of joy because you were able to give them something. The Bible says it's more joyful to give than to receive, right? How much more joyful it is to forgive. Forgive. Number nine. Total forgiveness is forgiving God. Isn't it amazing how much people will hold resentment toward God for things that have happened? There? Well, God allowed this rape to happen in my life. God allowed my mama to forsake me. God allowed my husband to leave me. God. No, 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 no. It happened. It happened, but it's not God's fault. It's all right to forgive God. I heard Karen Wheaton's testimony years ago. Karen Wheaton's husband, her first husband, uh, had an affair, and, and I think was, it ended up with several people. And she said, I was at a place in the living room floor banging my fist saying, God, I forgive. And she said, I began to list everybody. She said, I began to call their names. And finally at the end, she said, God, I forgive. And she said she couldn't hardly say it, but her spirit kept prompting her to say, I forgive you, God. Did God need her to say, I, does God need me to go, I forgive you, God, for the chaos in my life? He doesn't need that, but I need to. 
Because often the bitterness I feel may not be toward CB. It, it may just be toward God. And listen, there's a lot of people that have church hurt, and they ain't hurt at church, they're hurt at God. A lot of people are so angry with God because of the circumstances they've been in, and they need to let God off the hook. And that almost sounds sacrilegious, doesn't it? It almost sounds awkward for to say that, but it is, a, it is a place in your spirit. You've got to let God be the God of love in your life. Quit being mad at Him. You're never going to win that battle. Amen? Because, and let me say this, and I love this line. This is R.T. Kendall's line, awesome line in the book. God did not send Jesus to explain evil, but rather to forgive it. God did not send Jesus to explain why all the bad happened in your life. I just need to know, God. That's not why Jesus came. He came to forgive the wrong. You may not ever know why you had to go through a valley. You may not ever know why you went through the hardship you went through. You may not ever be able to comprehend why. But all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. God sent Jesus to forgive the evils, not to explain them. And then last but not least, number 10. Oh, do I have time to meddle here for a while? Number 10, total forgiveness is forgiving yourself. Forgiving people, forgiving God, forgiving yourself. There's no lasting joy in forgiveness, no matter how many people you forgive, if you can't forgive yourself. And isn't it amazing how many times we can't forgive us? A lot of times at night, it's not what George did or Betty Sue did, it's how you fit, in, how you fit into the story. And you can't get over what you did. And sometimes you can't get over why you let it happen. Anybody ever been in that boat? How could I let this happen? Why did I let this happen? How could I let that man abuse my kid? How could I let... You with me on that? And you, you, you finally get over George. You finally get over the incident, but now you can't forgive yourself. Why didn't I see the signs? Why didn't I hear the voices? Why didn't I know? And before long, everybody else is off the hook except for yourself. You'll never have lasting joy until you forgive yourself. And, and maybe that's the last sign of knowing you're living in total forgiveness is that you have peace with you. And you have joy with you. I'm trying to figure out how to, to land this plane, Shania, because I, I just don't think people understand. It. Sometimes we look in the mirror and we, none of us want to be conceited. You know, that's a bad thing, right? But then what happens is when we look in the mirror, the person looking back at us is only condemning us. It's not the preacher condemning me. Trina's not condemning me. Sister Renee's not condemning me. Sister Summer's not condemning me. It's me. So every time I begin to take a step forward in total forgiveness... I am now back at the mirror and I still am hurt because I can't forgive me. Everybody else has moved on in the story. Everybody else is asleep at night. Everybody else, I'm at peace with everybody else until I look in the mirror and now it's me again. You've got to be able to forgive yourself. You've got to be able to look in that mirror and go, you are loved. You are powerful. You are anointed. You are a child of God. You've got promise. You've got purpose. You've got to be able not to, oh, Chris, you've got to be able not to be guilty over s proclaiming good things in your life. Y'all are quiet again. Thank God for the air. Stanley tried to go amen, and he, he just mumbled it. Because what happens is we begin to feel guilty going, saying, I am blessed. Remember that one little passage in Scripture? 
God bless me indeed. Enlarge my territory, expand my coast, keep me healthy and wealthy. I, I made that part up. <laughs> keep me free from harm, God. And the next verse goes, and God answered. When you can look in the mirror and have enough respect for yourself to think that, oh my goodness, I'm almost done, but I'm going to preach just one more second. When you can look in the mirror and respect yourself enough to pray the same blessings over you that you're praying over your neighbor. If I can proclaim God's blessings over Sister Trina, but I don't respect myself enough to pray God's blessing over me. I proclaim things over Sister Trina, but I don't proclaim things over me because I don't feel worthy enough. Now respect yourself. Respect the child of God in you enough to allow God to bless you too. You better stand. Total forgiveness. Next week, Sister Karen, it ain't but seven points. Unless I don't forgot a couple. But I think it's supposed to be seven points next week. And then the next week we'll have our breakfast casseroles and I think Sister Amy and I had talked about having a sign-up sheet.